Coming up on today's episode of Airborne, a court confirms a $10 million judgment against Cirrus Aircraft on behalf of Alan Klatmeyer. The one-week wonder phase one flight testing is complete, and senators urge quick action on third-class medical reform. Welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. I'm Ashley Hale. Well, it comes as no surprise to those who have had to deal with Cirrus Aircraft's negative tactics and behaviors. A judge in Hennepin County, Minnesota last month dismissed post-trial motions filed by Cirrus Industries following a jury verdict that awarded $10 million to Alan Klatmeyer last March. The actual judgment was posted this week by the court. Klatmeyer had sued his former company, which he co-founded, with his brother Dale. The suit is complex, but it basically involves a breach of an agreement between Klatmeyer and Cirrus not to make disparaging comments about one another. A jury found that Cirrus had breached that agreement and that Klatmeyer had been harmed by their actions. This recent ruling upheld the jury's findings and affirmed the $10 million judgment. ANN has been investigating this case and a number of others in our continuing series exposing serious problems at Cirrus Aircraft, and we'll post updates shortly. During the week of EAA AirVenture Oshkosh 2014, thousands of people had a hand in building EAA's one-week wonder Zenith CH750 Cruiser. During the ensuing weeks, a handful of pilots have completed the required 40 hours of Phase 1 flight testing, beginning with the first flight by Jeff Skiles the day after the convention. EAA's Charlie Becker wrote, quote, The whole idea was to show everyone how building your own airplane from a modern kit is within reach, that it's fun, and that the EAA has all the resources you need to help you along the way. He added, mission accomplished, end quote. Now, all that remains to be done is paint, also a collaborative effort as EAA members first voted among 10 original designs provided by Scheme Designs. Becker plans to fly the airplane to the Zenith 23rd Annual Zenith Open Hangar Day and Fly-In, set for September 19th and 20th in Mexico, Missouri. After the break, senators urge quick action on third-class medical reform. You're watching Airborne. Redbird Flight Simulations is dedicated to revolutionizing flight training by designing, manufacturing, and delivering affordable and innovative flight training technologies. Each Redbird device is designed to enhance the training experience for pilots of all levels, from student to ATP. Redbird is quickly becoming the industry standard for flight training. Since Redbird introduced its revolutionary FMX in 2007, colleges, universities, and flight training operations around the world have integrated Redbird products into their curriculum. It's time to discover what Redbird can do for you. Join the migration. Welcome back. If you'd like to suggest a story for Airborne Aero TV, our website or podcast, drop an email to news by at aero news.net. 11 U.S. senators from both sides of the aisle, all co sponsor of a bill to reform the third class medical process, are asking the Department of Transportation and the Office of Management and Budget to take quick action on their review of the FAA's proposed medical rule reform. In the September 2nd letter to Transportation Secretary Anthony Fox and OMB Director Sean Donovan, the senator warned that, quote, this is a time-sensitive issue, end quote, and asked that both agencies complete their review within one month. The Senate letter notes in part that, quote, the FAA was asked to initiate a review nearly three years ago and has thoroughly analyzed the issues. In recent years, general aviation has suffered significant setbacks and our country risks losing its position as a global leader in GA, end quote. We at ANN can't help but wonder how many times a federal bureaucracy must directly be addressed by Congress to simply do their job. Well, it's Friday at last and time for this week's barnstorming commentary. But we actually have a change for you today. Jim has handed the reins over to the EAA's Dick Nepinski and Jack Pelton so they can explain some of their concerns and issues with the FAA's recent conjurings. Here's this week's barnstorming. Jack, there's been a lot of visibility about the hangar use policy draft forwarded by the FAA and what it could mean for individual aircraft owners, hangar users, and so forth. 
why is this such an important issue and why is it such a complex issue for a lot of people? Well, for EA and our members, the hangar use policy didn't have enough specific definition as to what aeronautical use is. So it was being interpreted at the local levels um, in a variety of different ways. And we want to make sure that there is a very clean understanding that people can use their hangars for assembly of aircraft, um, an active assembly of aircraft. And right now that could be interpreted locally uh, differently. We want to make sure that's perfectly clear. As far as the comments to the docket, an extension has been given for 30 days on that. Where is EA going with its comments? What does it want to say to the FAA about this policy? EA has put together a very comprehensive response, and we think it, it really encompasses the full breadth of our membership. So it's not only talking about active assembly of airplanes, but it's also talking about restoration and maintenance of airplanes, which we think uh, encompasses all of the EA activities that should occur in a hangar, along with uh, aeronautical use for organizations like our chapters and uh, the, the 99s and other groups that use facilities at an airport for aeronautical use. You've talked to a lot of people ever since our venture about this topic. What are you hearing? Where are some of the confusion points? I, I think there's a lot of confusion, and some of that is because how it's being interpreted at the local level. So there's a belief that if I have an airplane in my hangar, and it's a hard winter, and it's sitting there all, all year long, all winter long, and my snowblower's under the wing of the airplane, that I am in violation of my, my hangar use policy. And we want to make sure that those kinds of interpretations are are understood and that at the local level it can be governed appropriately and intelligently for uh, the use of a facility like that. And we don't think that that should be banned. A lot of people talk about home building. That's been one of the, the primary topics. Is it final assembly? Is it continual assembly? Is it active assembly? Where is EA standing on this right now? You know, EA is taking the position that, that a hangar, there's a point in a home built project that you, you need a hangar to put it together, to put the wings on it, to get the rest of the pieces together. Uh, yes, we understand that there's some detailed parts of a kit that could be done in a garage at home, um, which if that's the way the FAA goes, we, we understand their position on that. But we do believe that as that project's coming together, it needs to be done in a hangar and the policy should be written to clearly identify that that's acceptable. Have you been surprised by the confusion, the visibility, the the amount of chatter that this has created. I, I really have been concerned with how people are interpreting this. I've heard everything from this is the end of general aviation to actual letters that I've received where somebody has three airplanes in a hangar and an antique car and they say, they're, they're interpreting and saying, I gotta get rid of my hangar because I have that antique car in there and that'll no longer allow me to have a hangar, which is you know the one extreme to the other. So we've gotta get clarity, we've gotta get some definitions that uh, people can stand behind and, and, and use and defend at the local level. Do you see a good solution for this? Do you think there is a, a viable solution that will meet all the concerns that are out there? I do. I think as people step back from what I'm hearing in the FAA is what we're really trying to define is if you take federal money at an airport, uh, there's a definition as to what hangar usage should be. And what they don't want it to be is year-round storage for non-aircraft aviation intended purposes. So if it's full of boats and RVs and ATVs and there's not an aviation use at all in that hangar, they don't want that to occur. That's what I think they're really trying to protect. Now it's how do you get to a common understanding of that. Okay, well Jack, thanks so much. Thank you. Sometimes legal wranglings can be so complicated and cantankerous that it makes the Wild West days of a shootout at high noon look civilized. Zero G is the company that offers parabolic flights to simulate zero gravity in a modified Boeing 727 named G-Force One. Both NASA and private individuals use their services. However, a company named Amerijet actually owns parts of the plane and leases them to Zero G. Zero G has since parted ways with Amerijet through a termination of management services agreement on May 4th. And the separation of these companies has not been amicable. It's reported that court records indicated Amerijet repossessed the three jet engines that powered Zero G's 727, and say Zero G owes them more than $127,000. Zero G has disputed this claim, and so the legal showdown begins. This means Zero G is not flying right now, but they state the company is currently in the process of restructuring flight operations management and it would be posting its 2015 schedule in the coming months. Find out after the break what company was awarded the NAA Collier Trophy. You're watching Airborne. 
ADS-V will be mandatory for most aircraft by 2020 in the United States. But you can benefit from ADS-V today with the Ben McSteen KT-74 Mode S Transponder. The KT-74 meets the global mandates for ADS-V out when attached to a suitable WASP GPS. Finally, the extraordinary story of the world-changing XPRIZE space competition is being told and illustrated with hundreds of insider photos in Jim Campbell's colorful new book, Beyond the Blue. Journey with Jim as he flies formation with spaceships, plays in zero gravity, prepares rocket racers, and documents the amazing first decade of the personal space race. Available this summer, get your advance order in now by checking out www.kindredspirit.com. Welcome back. On September 5th, the U.S. National Aeronautical Association recognized the Sierra Nevada Corporation with the Robert J. Collier Trophy for one of the company's greatest achievements in aeronautics. Teamed with Northrop Grumman and the U.S. Navy, SNC received the award for its contribution to the U.S. Navy's Unmanned Combat Air System Demonstrator Program. Autoland recover of the X-47B aboard an aircraft carrier was a major program milestone achieved in 2013. SNC's team provided the precision navigation technology and contributed significantly to the development of the guidance and control system. The X-47B is a tailless strike fighter-sized unmanned aircraft able to autonomously operate from and perform arrested landings upon an aircraft carrier. In 2013, these aircraft were used to successfully demonstrate the first ever carrier-based launches and recoveries by an autonomous, low-observable unmanned aircraft. Captain Bo Duarte, program manager for the U.S. Navy's Unmanned Carrier Aviation Program, said, quote, SNC, a key member of the X-47B government industry team, is most deserving of the elite recognition of the Collier Trophy, end quote. The Commemorative Air Force will showcase a collection of World War II aircraft during their CAF World War II Expo at Dallas Executive Airport October 3rd through the 5th. Four of the most popular bombers from that era will be on the ramp, including Fifi, the world's only flying B-29 Superfortress. Other attending bombers include the B-17 Flying Fortress, the B-24 Liberator, and the B-25 Mitchell. Vintage military fighters will include a P-40 Warhawk and two P-51 Mustangs. Visitors will have the opportunity to tour the bomber cockpits, visit educational displays, and even purchase rides on many of the planes. Veterans will also be on site to share their personal stories about their experiences during World War II. Well, that's our program. Remember to get comprehensive, real-time, 24-7 coverage of the latest aviation and aerospace stories at aero-news.net. Remember, Airborne is streamed three times a week and is always online. Join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for a new episode. And remember, there are some big upgrades coming soon to Airborne. I'm Ashley Hale. Thanks for watching.